Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Hello, loyal listeners. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. You know, it's August and farmers markets are in full swing. So I thought it'd be a great time to talk about fruits and vegetables. So that's what today's episode is all about. Also, I recently attended the Produce for Better Health conference a few months ago. And I definitely wanted to finally bring the focus on produce and pesticides to the show. You know, I think it's one of the most important topics in nutrition that affects everyone. So uh, speaking of farmer's markets, my daughter and I recently did our last pickup of produce donations for our community food pantry. It's our last one together before she goes off to college. So it's kind of bittersweet. It's hard to believe we've been doing these since 2009. She was only nine years old when we started, so now I guess my 10-year-old son will have to fill in for her. If you haven't made it to the farmer's market yet this year, try to get out there and be sure to check out my video, Eight Tips for Shopping the Farmer's Market, and also the Guide to Food Safety at Farmer's Markets. Both of those are in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com forward slash 97, plus all the other great resources that we discuss in today's show, such as the Pesticide Residue Calculator. Speaking of episode 97, can you believe we are almost at 100 episodes? It just blows my mind. I, I can't believe it. So if you've been following me on social media, and I hope you have, I hope we are connected. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Melissa Joy RD. And of course, all of my social media links are in my show notes always. But if you've been following me, you may have seen that I injured my foot in ballet class. I landed a jump and I felt a sharp pain on near my instep right at my heel. It hurt pretty bad. I couldn't, I couldn't stand on it. <laughs> and I've never felt, um, I've never really had any injuries. I'm, I'm very lucky. I've never broken a bone. I've never, you know, had to have stitches, never, you know, really torn anything with all of my, you know, dancing growing up and, and physical activity. I'm very fortunate, especially since I'm kind of a clumsy person. But anyway, I digress. So I was really encouraged that about 24 hours later, it felt a lot better. That first day, I was, I'll tell you, I was kind of anxious and worried. But 24 hours later, it felt much better. It certainly was not 100%. And I thought, well, I'll just rest it. So I didn't do any exercise for a week. And I wore tennis shoes and I kept my foot up and iced it and did everything. And I tried ballet again a week later. And I made it through the bar, but when we got to center, I I knew I couldn't do it. So I ended up going to the doctor, and long story short, turns out I have a tear in the fascia on the bottom of my foot. So I get to wear a boot around for about three weeks to help it heal, and hopefully that will be the extent of it. So why am I telling you this? I just really wanted to give everybody a reminder, you know, not to take for granted all of the great and wonderful things our bodies can do. And to give you another reminder or excuse or incentive to get out there and enjoy doing whatever it is you enjoy, walking, swimming, biking, dancing, sports, whatever you love, get out there and enjoy it. I hope that I will be back to ballet soon. You know that I love it. And I hope that I'll be able to heal before my ballroom dance competition as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. And thank you again for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. And be sure to check out all the great resources in the show notes. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, I delve into the science the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And today is all about produce, fruits, veggies, pesticides, organic, conventional, what do you do? You know, I really feel like this is one of the most important topics that are on the minds of shoppers, 
what do I buy? What do I eat? What should I do? So I'm really excited to introduce Teresa Thorne, who is the Executive Director of the Alliance for Food and Farming. Welcome to the show, Teresa. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks so much for having us today. Oh, we have a lot of good stuff to talk about. The work that you are doing with Alliance for Food and Farming is so important. You guys have great resources, a great website. We're going to get into all of that. But first of all, tell me a little bit about your role and maybe how long you've been with the Alliance and also what's your background? So I have been with the Alliance since 2003, so it's been a while. My background, I come from, uh, my dad was a citrus farmer in the San Joaquin Valley of California. So I was born and raised working on citrus farms, helping to irrigate that grove and, you know, enjoying walking in the grove in the evenings and picking an orange and eating it right, right off the tree. And I really developed a love of farming from how I grew up and really wanted to, even back then, share with consumers how we grow our food and, and the care and commitment that, that, that my dad put into ensuring that those oranges were safer and for his consumers as well. Yes. Yeah, so from an early age, you had a feel for this life, this farming life, the importance of fresh fruits and vegetables and all forms of fruits and vegetables, actually. And, you know, kind of that agriculture background that, that a lot of people don't really have. What was your professional background that led you to bringing the agriculture into it and then coming to the Alliance for Food and Farming? Sure. Well, I'll go back to, to college. I majored in journalism and have a, almost a major, three units shy, of, uh, in plant science. And so I really combined the, the knowledge of agriculture in with communication skills in my journalism background. And so I have over the years, I, I worked for the strawberry industry before joining the Alliance for Food and Farming. And again, in that role of helping consumers better understand how we grow our fruits and vegetables. So I've been doing this throughout my career. I'm very passionate about the produce industry and very passionate about, again, the hard work that farmers do every day to bring safe food to your tables. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's a very interesting, almost double major there with the journalism and plant science. That's really fascinating. Yes. And, and I know that you're passionate. I've heard you speak and do interviews. And now it makes even more sense why you're such a good communicator because you have a degree in it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was really impressed when I heard you speak. I was like, wow, that's really awesome. <laughs> so tell us about the Alliance for Food and Farming, what it's all about, who it is, and the work that you guys do. So the Alliance is an organization, and our goal really is to provide credible information so consumers can make good choices and in, in the right choices for their family in the, in the produce aisle. So we talk a lot about produce safety. We are strong advocates of consumer choice, organic or conventional. We just hope that you know that you can eat either with confidence, choose either with confidence, but always choose to eat more. And so that's really what our organization, the goal of our organization, we represent farmers or organizations that represent farmers. That's it. If you don't fall into that category, you cannot be, we can't take your contribution. You can't be a member of the Alliance. And when I say farming, it's specific to fruits and vegetables. So those, that's kind of our main purpose and our main goal. Right. Thank you for explaining, because I think it's really important for the listeners to know that it is both conventional and organic farmers and working together to convey that all produce is safe and the bottom line is, yeah, eating more of it. So that's a real sort of simple top line, but we're going to get into some of the, the questions and concerns and the, but wait a minute that people might have, you know, whether they're a consumer, a shopper, or a health professional listening who hears some of these questions or concerns from their patients or clients. So we're going to dive into some of that and also talk about the resources that are available. But I don't want to forget to say that this episode is sponsored by the Alliance for Food and Farming, and we're very grateful that we're having this partnership with you. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So maybe a good place to start is, you know, we've already 
you know, kind of said, look, the bottom line is whether you want to choose organic or conventional, it's all safe. And we're really focusing on the safety. So what we're talking about there is pesticides. And, you know, the the difference between organic and conventional farming doesn't affect the safety of the food or the nutrition of the food. So, you know, some of the questions that come up for people are, well, what about pesticides pesticide residues. You know, there's a difference between pesticide residue and risk, which I'd like you to explain. But maybe, you know, I've I've talked a lot about pesticides on the podcast before. So this might be a bit of a repeat depending on what order my episodes air. But can you talk a little bit about what pesticides are and why they're even used or important, and then kind of get into the residue versus risk? Mm-hmm. So organic and conventional farmers both practice in the, in the produce industry, both have very similar practices and, and pesticides on both organic and conventional farms are only used as a last resort when press pressure is to an extent or disease pressure that something needs to be done. They both practice integrated pest management, which is a bit of a complicated issue. Um, again, I'm not a scientist, but I'll try and communicate where you're using the environment to help you farm. So that can be by promoting beneficial insects, for instance, to come to your farm and, and the bad bugs, eat the good bugs, excuse me, eat the bad bugs. It can be ensuring that your moisture levels and your irrigation levels, you know, you're not over irrigating. So, and again, irrigation is its own science in itself, but ensuring that that so you know disease pressure and and root borne diseases are are kept at a minimum and and so when it gets to that last resort resort point that's when again there's no choice we're going to have substantial loss to the crop if we don't take care of this pest or disease. And, you know, pesticides in both organic and conventional production are very rigorously regulated at the federal level, and then individual states also regulate. And then organic producers also have their audit system that they have to go through audits to ensure that their productions do meet the organic standards. So there's a lot of layers and there's a lot of regulation in terms of when and how you can apply a pesticide and which pesticide you can apply on your farm. This is not something that's taken or done lightly. When a pesticide's applied, it's it's done because the science and the information and necessitate this action. Mm-hmm. Great. And you've mentioned this, so but I want to put a finer point on it because a lot of people think that organic farming does not use pesticides. So can you speak to that quickly? Well, it doesn't have to be quick. <laughs> So, yeah, in fact, a lot of organic and conventional uh, farmers use the exact same ones. In California, for instance, it's the only state that actually does record what pesticides are used on farms and in industrial settings as well. And two of the top three pesticides used in the state of California, which is a very heavy produce growing area, as most know, are approved for both organic and conventional production. Right, great. And it's my understanding, as I've learned before, but I want to clarify this as well, is that conventional farming can use a variety of methods that, you know, could be used for organic farming or conventional farming, whereas organic has just a little different list of options, if you will. If it's organic farming options, that can also be used in conventional, like you said. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, yeah, a lot of times the similarities, in fact, we've got videos on our website that address this, the similarities between organic and conventional farming are in the produce industry, especially are you can readily see that we're using very, very similar methods on both ranches. And also, too, this is important to know, a lot of organic farmers grow conventionally as well. And so they have both offerings for consumers. So. Right. There's that's that crossover a great point. as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't don't realize that as well. Okay, so let's talk about pesticide residues versus risk. And, you know, I think we have this concept that if there's any even minute amount of pesticide on there, it's bad. But there's no way to have zero risk when it comes to just eating food in general. So can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I would, I would say we're pretty darn close to zero in terms of when you look at the level of residues they're detecting now, they're down into the parts per 
million part per billion levels, which are exceptionally, exceptionally minute. In fact, we quantify that. We have a calculator function that is based on an analysis by toxicologists with the University of California Personal Chemical Exposure Program. And they found that you could a child could literally eat hundreds to thousands of servings of a fruit and vegetable in a day and still not have any effect from residues. That's how low they are. And so I, I think that's really important to keep into context because we are talking about such minute levels of residues. Right. And as you're talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just even said the wrong way. I said it the wrong way because what I meant to say is there's going to be some exposure, but that doesn't mean that it's a risk. And I even just interchanged those words. So it gets a little confusing. Yeah, it is. It is. So imagine if you're a consumer, you know, I deal with this every day. I deal with explaining every day. I look at the reports coming out from the government and from toxicologists every day. But if you're a consumer, where do you go? Where do you go for information on this subject? And and so that's why at the we try and provide that in a easy, straightforward, transparent manner for consumers. Absolutely. Right. So I think consumers feel like, oh, there should be nothing at all in the food. And if there's even a minute little pesticide that I'm exposed to, that equals risk, that equals cancer. And that's where the difference is between the levels set by the EPA versus how much we would have to eat in order for it to be a risk. And this is where the pesticide residue calculator comes in. And all of these resources are on your site at safefruitsandveggies.com. And we'll walk through all of the different things that people can find there. But this is a great tool on the website. I was playing around with it the other day. So I clicked on woman and strawberries and I got, I came up with, I'd have to have 454 servings of strawberries in one day would still have no effect, even if the strawberries had the highest pesticide residue recorded for strawberries by the USDA. And and imagine if you convert that further, I don't have a calculator in front of me, so don't ask me to do it. But if you take the 400 plus servings a woman could eat, imagine that there's eight strawberries in every serving, right? That's not even 454 strawberries. It's right. That's a lot of strawberries. And again, you're still not reaching what toxicologists call the no effect level. So there's even at that level, you're, you're not going to have any effect from residues. Effects from other things, obviously, for eating that many strawberries. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think you'd have. <laughs> and again, a tummy that's ache. in a day. That's in a <laughs> right. day. So. In a day. Right, right. Right. And, you know, for people who are worried about children, well, you know, there's different sizes. You can click on child and do the same calculation. I, I should have done that for a comparison, but I, but I didn't. Yes. So that is very reassuring. And I just, I like how really just quantifies instead of just, oh, you, you couldn't possibly eat enough to really add up to, you know, it, it being a risk. Well, this, you know, this number is very specific. It quantifies it. And like you said, that's in a day. What do you say to people who are concerned about, and I know there's research areas on, on the site, and we're going to talk about some, uh, a couple of research articles in, in particular, but what do you say to people about, well, what about exposure over time and that compound is, or collective exposure over time? Yeah. Well, again, we're consuming at such low, minute levels. And what I would point to is that there are decades of research that show the nutritional value of fruits and vegetables extends life and it prevents diseases. One of the most compelling ones is we looked at this because of the fact that I I get asked that question a lot. And so we went to some respected nutritionists with expertise actually in maternal health as well as heart disease. And he actually authored a paper where he looked at risk pesticide risk of consuming, you know, increasing your intake of fruits and vegetables. And is there a cancer risk from residues associated with that? What he found was a compelling opposite effect, which is if you increase, if half of Americans increase their consumption of a single, of a fruit and vegetable by a single serving each day, 20,000 cancer cases could be prevented annually. So he actually determined that no, increasing consumption, you're going to really decrease your risk. And again, this was done on conventional produce. The toxicology science that shows the safety of conventionally grown 
the regulatory protections in place combined with the nutrition data really are a very, very compelling argument that the best thing you can do is eat more fruits and vegetables, organic or conventionally grown. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll link to that research as well. Yeah. Because I was reviewing that before the interview. And I think I may have mentioned this to you just the other day, a woman in my ballet class asked me about organic versus conventional due to cancer fear. Her mother is a breast cancer survivor and it really wants her to buy everything organic. And I said, well, you know, I, of course I talked about the safe fruits and veggies website and the, the calculator. And, um, I said, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, the best thing you can do to prevent cancer is eat more produce. So go to the site, look into this, you know, see, cause she was like, I, I just can't possibly buy everything organic. And I said, well, and I don't want you to feel like you have to or to worry, you know, so this is, I think, you know, people think produce you know, I know I need to get more, or maybe they don't even know they need to get more. We can talk about that as well, because that's always kind of mind blowing. Like people think they're doing fine. It's like, no, you're not. You could give me a statistic probably right now, how many Americans are actually eating adequate servings of produce every day? Only one in 10, according to the Centers for Disease Control. And just to go backward a little bit on your question with breast cancer, we just we just posted a, a blog because we're always looking at new nutrition studies and information on this subject. New study just came out that, and it was comprehensive. They studied the diet of women, I believe it was over 32 years, and found that women who ate 5.5 servings per day decreased their can breast cancer risk by 11% over women who weigh 2.5. Now, if it's 32 years, years old, they were, you know, this was done also looking at conventionally grown produce. So yes, among the best things you can do, uh, again, is, is eating more. But I think where you got, where you win is, is, is really important. And this is where I go. Again, we support consumer choice. And so you want to be a, a very loyal organic consumer. Great. We're all for that. And we don't dispute that if that's your choice. Again, in my family, we eat primarily conventional. Just so I know a lot about it. There's times I'll buy organic if the quality or, or it's on sale or things along those lines, but primarily we eat conventional. But the thing I think is really important is what you just said. Either I can't always afford organic or it's not always available to me. So if you're on your family vacation, right, and the fast food chains are the only option on your, you know, your kids are hungry, you should be reassured that those apples, those sliced apples in your kids' kids meal is the right choice. Restaurants, you're eating in a restaurant, they may not have an organic alternative, but the salad is still the good choice here. And so that's the thing to me that's really important is that we may have a choice but we don't always have the choice we want. And so it's really important that people are reassured about the safety of produce and that it's always a good choice to, to eat more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And, and I did see, I got the email about the breast cancer study. It was Thursday because I got the email when I got home from ballet and I forwarded it to my friend. I said, here, this is exactly what we were just talking about. So, Perfect. um, Good. you know, want her to look at that and read that. And, you know, we actually spoke for quite a while after ballet. And, and at one point she said, Oh my gosh, the more I'm learning, the more questions I have. And, and I'm like, I yeah, know yeah. we can really get kind of down a rabbit hole sometimes, but that Understand. means you have, yeah, that means you're really interested. And she's, I think she's going to be the kind of person who can just take a look herself. And, you know, I kind of just pointed her in the right direction and <laughs> she can take yeah. it from there. And I'm sure Absolutely. That's exactly where, where we're at. Look at the information, decide what's right for you and what's right for your family. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and like you said, you know, it's like, okay, when you get these questions, where do you go? And mm -hmm. the safefruitsandveggies.com website, like you mentioned some videos. So there's videos on pesticides, farming, the dirty dozen, which we'll talk about healthy mm -hmm. eating, pregnancy and regulations, which is really interesting. So you yeah. can look and see, compare the regulations for conventional and organic and just look at that for yourself. Farmers markets are in full swing right now. You guys have a guide to food safety at farmers markets, which is awesome. We mentioned the, the research section. We talked about cancer risks versus benefit and chronic dietary exposure to pesticide residue. The, the point that I brought up earlier, there's research on that and that eating more 
servings reduces the risk of premature death. There's a health and nutrition section, which is primarily, it's got nutrients in the different fruits and vegetables. So that's a nice to take a look at just to kind of, you know, feel better about, hey, I'm getting lots of good stuff in these. The safety standards section, oh, that's where you can look more at the regulations that I was talking about. There's a blog. And then probably the most important section on there talks about just wash it. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. But let's talk about the dirty dozen first. Explain to the listeners, they may or may not have heard of the dirty dozen and the environmental working group. So tell us what this is and how you guys are sort of trying to set the record straight on this list. Absolutely. And setting the record straight is very important because a lot of what the alliance does is we correct inaccurate and misinformation about the the safety of our produce. We know that it's important to do that because there's been a couple studies, one in particular, a peer-reviewed study that found that disparaging produce with the messaging that the EWG uses with their dirty dozen list, it actually dissuades consumers, especially low-income consumers, from purchasing any produce, organic or conventional. So with only one in 10 of us eating enough fruits and vegetables to begin with, this type of disparagement or or using fear to disparage conventionally grown is just not in the best interest of, of public health. So since 1995, long time, the Environmental Working Group has put out its Dirty Dozen list. And what they do is they take, they're always the most popular, the most kid-friendly fruits and vegetables, and they make claims regarding substitute organic for these because these are the dirtiest, quote-unquote, fruits and vegetables. Now, what's interesting about that is that there is also peer-reviewed studies that show that substitution of organic forms for conventional forms does not result in any decrease in risk because the residues on, on conventional are so low. So we work diligently to provide information and correct the misinformation that has been put out by the Environmental Working Group every year. Again, it is not a scientifically valid piece. Their methodology has also been examined and it shows they do not follow any established scientific procedures in creating this list. But more importantly, as I said at the beginning of uh, my answer to your question, is that it actually is, peer-reviewed studies is actually showing it has a potential negative impact on health initiatives that are working so diligently to try and increase consumption for, for better health. I'll add just a personal note or my personal frustration is, you know, Melissa, your colleagues in the the registered dietitian nutritionist world, this is the only food group. Fruits and vegetables are the only food group you all recommend eat more of every single day. And so to have somebody come out and call those healthy and safe fruits and vegetables that farmers work hard every day to produce dirty is uh, really offensive to me. So that's just a personal thing. But anyway, like I said, we have these great products. We know they're healthy. We know they improve health. And so to do anything, you know, to discourage consumption of them, uh, like I said, is is disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing that. And the research study that you're talking about, I believe, is the one that was published in Nutrition Today. And so I'll link to that in my show notes. And I know it's on, on your site as well. But that study confirmed a, a lot of, I don't want to say the word fear a lot, but if that's the word, a lot of that fears is. that this type of communication and this type of approach was not helpful to consumers. And it's it's worse than we thought. So it makes sense, you know, and, and educators, dietitians who work with patients and clients, it makes perfect sense. If they're confused then they're sort of paralyzed. And research shows if they don't have a clear call to action that feels safe and right to them, then they don't do anything. They don't take action. And we want people to not only enjoy fruits and vegetables, but they need to in order to have good health. And, you know, we, you know, we don't want them to be afraid. I always say I want people to be informed and unafraid. And this type of fear mongering is so frustrating to every health educator and health professional as well. So we share your frustration. Yeah. And the farmer's first consumer is their own family, whether they grow organic or conventional. So to imply 
that they would serve anything to their kids or their spouse or their parents that is not safe and not grown with care. Again, it makes no logical sense. Right, right. Well, and I think a lot of people, you know, see the dirty dozen list and say, okay, Mm -hmm. these are the foods I should buy as organic. But that brings me back to the conversation that we were having earlier Mm -hmm. about the safety of both and people not wanting to be afraid of good, wholesome food. Correct. They can buy the organic versions of that. And this is what I always say, like, make the choice that you want, but don't make it out of fear. Make it for another reason. You know, everybody has personal preference. I agree. And again, whatever your choice is, that's fine. Wherever you choose to purchase is fine. You know, you brought up farmers markets and uh, which are great places to, and great places to also learn more about your food, to talk to the farmer directly, you know, grocery store, CSA, whatever, however you choose to consume it or where you purchase it. Again, we just always hope you choose to eat more. And so it is, like I said, it's disturbing that a group would, would come out and name call really just without really any scientific basis at all. And they've been doing it since 1995. They've been doing it every year and they'll continue to do it every year. But that's what we ask is just kind of to to learn more a little bit about it. But keep in mind, the science shows that their recommendation doesn't hold up and you're not decreasing your risk by substituting those organic forms again, because conventional forms are so low if residues are present even at all. Two more things about this list is there are dietitians out there who don't realize that this isn't really on the up and up. So I want to, you know, I want to put a finer point on that. Anybody listening, if this is news to you, please look into the safefruitsandveggies.com site and, and look more into the Dirty Dozen because I do see some dietitians promoting it and I'm like, oh, I don't think they realize what what they're promoting. And, you know, sometimes things seem a certain way on on the surface, and you got to dig a little deeper. The other thing is, we're starting to see more and more, and you could speak to this, perhaps, is the mainstream media kind of calling out the dirty dozen and saying, okay, well, the list came out again, but it's not really holding water. They're talking to other experts, and they're talking to experts to find out, okay, what's the deal with this? So... Yeah, no, we're definitely seeing that more. And what we're also seeing, uh, to your previous point, too, is that folks are, uh, dietitians are saying, you know what, we've always, you know, kind of when the Dirty Dozen list has, have promoted this, and, and now let's dig a little bit deeper into this and, and see what we find. And they're actually finding the opposite is true. They're looking at it and seeing the science behind it just does not stand up. We saw that most recently, the Huffington Post, I want to say two weeks ago, just ran a a pretty in-depth piece on the Dirty Dozen list going exactly to that, which is right, the dozen stand up. Mm -hmm. Good, great. Well, and, you know, if you take a closer look at the environmental working group or just look at like their social media feed, so much fear mongering, it just, you know, that should be a red flag for people (laughs) that it's like, well, okay, wait, we we don't want to scare people, we want to help people. And so that brings me to a question. What do you say, if people criticize the EPA? Okay, so you're saying, you know, that these levels are set well below the acceptable, you know, levels. But you know, we don't trust the EPA. What, What do you say to that? Well, the first thing is I appreciated your call out. We do have a section on safety standards. Uh, we try and make sure everything on our website is written by someone with expertise in that area. And, and that section that outlines the pesticide regulations for both conventional and organic was written by the former Deputy of Communications for California Department of Pesticide Regulations. So what I would say to that is that the Environmental Protection Agency the USDA and the FDA, there are safety standards in place governing the the approval and the use of organic and conventional pesticides that not only protect consumers, but farm workers and the environment as well. Those safety standards that especially that EPA puts on food called tolerances, those are a hundredfold increase in in safety margins. So they set a safety margin, then they times that a hundred times. So it is protective of sensitive subpopulations as well. 
we hear a lot of comparisons with the European system, and, and actually the U.S. system is more rigorous than the European system, then that's federal. Then you also have states that have individual pesticide laws and regulations. One of the best known is California. We have a, a, I'm based in California. That's why I said we. But California has the California Department of Pesticide Regulation that adds another layer on the stringent laws and regulations already set in place. So they are extremely protective. And again, they are rigorous. And you can learn more on our our website on those safety sections because it is confusing. And that's why we went to, we decided it's like, look, we got to put this all in one place because there's different agencies that do different things. And so to have it all captured in one place is very helpful. I'll tell you, it's helpful to me because (laughs) there's, like I said, there's so many layers. It's like, wait a minute, let me go back and check this again. And, and, And so I reference back to that section quite a bit. So anyway, I would I would urge people if you've got more concerns to look at that as well. Yes, and and all of the resources on the website are really geared towards consumers and health professionals. You know, I mean, health professionals are consumers too. We're people too, you know, like I always say. So they're all really easy to read and clear. You can find what you're looking for. It's it's really great. And you can get more if you want to. There's links to everything. And then, you know, if you look at the safety section, you want to do a deeper dive into um, pesticide regulatory standards, you certainly can. Same with the research page. We kind of have the overview, but then we always, which is, you know, just kind of a, a quick, let me see what that research says, and we, you know, bullet pointed. But then we also link to the full papers. So that, you know, if you're a health professional or a consumer who wants to know more, you know, about that study in Nutrition Today, the full papers are always posted as well. Oh, great. Thank you. I, I wasn't aware of that. So I'm you can dig that. and dive as deep as you want. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Now, this just popped into my head while you were talking. And so I wanted to, to ask you this. So I attended the Produce for Better Health conference earlier in the spring. And one of the things that they brought up in one of the sessions I had heard before. And I think it's a really good point that I want to share with people. It's about recalls. We're hearing a lot of produce recall. We're hearing all, all kinds of recalls. But one thing that I don't, don't think people realize is just because you're hearing more recalls doesn't mean there are more problems than were before. This is a, it's a better communication system for one thing. But I also learned, and maybe you could speak to this because I don't want to say it wrong, but there's a difference between, um, now I'm blanking on the terms, but a recall doesn't necessarily mean that there was actually somebody got sick. So can you speak to that? So, yeah. So a recall is a generally a voluntary action by the company, and they have a reason to be concerned about a risk. A lot of times the risk is low, especially in you know working with a lot of in the past produce related. The risk is fairly low, but again, we're going to do the right thing by recalling this product and and pull it out of store shelves and have you pull it out of your kitchen. So it is, it's a very important differentiation. Pay attention to that recall, but it generally is voluntary by the company just doing the right thing. Outbreak is when people are actually sick, right? And that's a, that's a different matter. But yes, you're correct in your differentiation. With a recall, no one is ill. It's a, it's a voluntary action by that company doing the right thing. Right. So I think, you know, it's like these terms, this terminology, sometimes, you know, one thing kind of sounds like something else. And we hear, you know, we were hearing more recalls. So there must be more recalls, something's wrong with the food system. And, you know, people are getting sick. But again, it's better detection, like, you know, where did things break down in the food chain, in the food food distribution supply chain, if you will. And, you know, that better communication of it, better steps toward safety and preventing those problems. So a lot of that is so counterintuitive. So I did want to bring that up. So let's talk about washing produce, because at the end of the day, you know, yes, we want people eating more produce, whether it's conventional or organic. But I did a TV segment on produce and pesticides a few years ago. And this was like the biggest take home that I still tell people, whether it's conventional or organic, you got to wash it. And people are like, really? So let's talk about that. What do we need to know about washing produce? And how do we do it? Well, so just, yeah, just taking it from the residue standpoint, FDA is fairly clear that you can remove and 
often eliminate any residues that may be present at all. But more importantly, you want to wash your fruits and vegetables because you want to remove that dirt that may be left over from when it was on the farm. You know, in grocery stores, farmers markets, other people are touching it. And so wash your produce. But I think there's a lot of misinformation about this as well in terms of do I need to use this and and, and no. What do I wash it with, right? The science, right. The science is fairly clear. Running tap water, right? Don't hot isn't isn't great, but if you want to use warm, that's fine. I use cold because I think it it's better for the perishability of the fruits and vegetables. But cold running t- tap water. If you're washing things like blueberries or strawberries, the best thing to do is just use a colander. Make sure that colander is clean. But again, running that colander under running tap water is the best. You don't need any produce washes. You don't need baking soda. You don't need vinegar. None of those things are are necessary. Just cold or warm running tap water. And for some produce that are sturdy enough, you can use just a little scrub brush. Scrub brush is great. For leafy greens, remove the outer leaves. That's a good practice. You'll you'll see a lot of kind of, you know, just from being in the store, you know, a little bit of bruising and, and such on those outer leaves, but remove those outer leaves. And yes, on things like carrots and, and potatoes, if you want to use a scrub brush, that's great too. Yeah. I'm going to start telling people to rinse it because I was telling my friend in ballet, yeah, and make sure you just wash your produce. And she looked at me, she's like, wash, like, with water, right? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, rinse it, rinse it, (laughs) change it to that. Yeah. No, you know what? That's a really good point. I never really thought of that on our website, the kind of the, you know, quick instructions on how to do it. It's called just wash it. But you're right. That word may be a little bit confusing. It is more of a rinse than anything else. Yeah. And this is what I do. So if you change it, I would be so (laughs) honored that I helped clarify and communicate more clearly. You contributed. Yes. Just rinse it. That's going to be my new slogan. So then I have to share a funny story. Well, let me ask you this first. What if the package says washed and ready to eat? So you're probably better off not washing that. There is, because it has been done for you, there also is the risk of when you take that out and and dump it into the colander of, you know, potential cross-contamination. So with, you know, if you've just... You're taking something pretty clean and maybe yeah, making it less clean by washing it. Yeah. So so no, that uh, enjoy that convenience. And no, there's no there's no need. I don't rewash something that has been washed and packaged. Cool. So and, and I want to talk briefly about storage, but then I, I have to tell you a funny story. At the risk of sounding like an idiot. <laughs> So way back when I was in college, went to Southern Illinois Carbondale, and I worked at Quattro's Pizza, which is the best pizza in the world, by the way. And we had salads. (laughs) And we had to wash the spinach for the spinach salads. And I think I was really tired one morning. I don't know. And the spinach came to us from the farm, and it had like, you know, dirt and mud and stuff on it. And I had washed, aka rinsed, the spinach many, many times before. Okay. But that day, I decided to use a little detergent. <laughs> oh. and, yeah. And the owner comes in and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm washing the spinach. He's like, not with soap. Okay. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Detergent, by the way, is not approved for no, food. No, for, it's <laughs> not an edible. No, yeah. So no, 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 no. Yeah. That's so not what that's for. But you know, so whenever anybody asks me, that's why. So you know, I'm really tied to this. Just rinse it because I do think some people might, you know, put a little detergent there, and that would be the worst possible I, thing. I have, I have, yeah, <laughs> I've heard of that too, and and like, don't do that because again, detergent is approved for washing dishes and not for washing fruits and vegetables. So that's not something that's approved for use on your food. You know, pesticides before they're applied have to go, like I said, through very rigorous years before they get approved for use and, and tons of scientific studies. And then again, we've got that 100 fold safety margin. So they've really been tested quite in depth. No for detergent. <laughs> right, exactly. Detergent, so not yeah, so much. Right, that. exactly. Right, right, right. Okay. I didn't see on your site, but I know that they have this fruits and veggies more matters.org. But I was just thinking of this this morning storing your produce, which fruits and vegetables should go in the refrigerator, which should be at room temperature. Do you have anything like that on your site? 
We don't because so many people do it well. Um, uh, so, so yes, more matters is a great place to go. It really depends on the commodity. And I will say that a lot of individual commodities, if you enter strawberries, for instance, you'll get websites like the California Strawberry Commission, for instance, that, that has information on the best way to store strawberries. You know, the Blueberry Council, same. So if you enter the commodity you're interested in, you can either go to more matters or you can just do a general Google internet search. And, and you'll probably get that. And like I said, so many folks, Produce Marketing Association, Produce for Better Health Foundation, do great jobs with storage. So we really don't have very much specific to that. Yeah, that's what I thought. And that, that's fine. I just wanted to check. So I found a one pager from fruits and veggies, more matters.org. And I'll, I'll link to that on my show notes as well. But I love your tip. Like if you just want to know about avocados, go to avocados, they're going to have go much to the more avocado commission. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to have so much more specific, helpful information. But if you just want a simple one pager, you can find that in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com or, or go to fruits and veggies, more matters.org and, and look around for that. But you know, I love learning something new, like, hey, when my avocado is at just the amount, just the perfect ripeness, I put it in the fridge and it holds, you know, but prior to that, it's on my counter. And so, you know, I'm actually doing a whole interview with a colleague, Joan Salji Blake on food waste. So we'll talk more in that episode about, you know, that's the other thing where you can really stretch your your produce dollar by storing your produce properly and using it up before it, it goes bad. So that's an, a whole separate episode. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and that also helps with consumption, right? You know, the, the, the more you know how to store it and eating it at the peak ripeness and it just, it just improves your experience with it. So yeah, no, that'll be a, that'll be a great segment with Joan. Yeah. She's amazing. So I know that you are working on an influencer food blogger tour. Um, tell us about that because it sounds wonderful. And unfortunately, not everybody listening would be able to, to go on a tour like that. But tell us about your, your work and what your goal is with, with these types of tours. Well, and what you just said is the reason why. We would love, you know, if we could get consumers into our fields and farms and experience it firsthand, that obviously is from a logistical standpoint, not going to happen. But what we can do is we can bring folks in that, that regularly talk with consumers and to provide their perspective on, on what they've seen. So that's exactly why we do it, is to bring the influencers out that, that work a lot with consumers and, and speak to consumers and show them firsthand what we do so they can communicate that back. We're all about transparent communication. Again, we're all about making sure that you have the information you need to make the right choice for your family when you're buying produce. And so this is just a, an effort to make that happen. Well, thank you for doing that. And, and yes, having been on many farm tours and worked for the Dairy Council for eight years, it is such a treat to be able to see all of that firsthand. And there are ways now with virtual and social and digital communications to try to bring the farm to the consumer. So I appreciate the the work you're doing there. And yeah, we'll I'll help keep spreading the good word. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about the Alliance for Food and Farming or produce or, or anything that I didn't ask that you think is really important for our listeners to know? Well, like I said, I think I just would go back to that statement of, of, of keep in mind whether you grow organic or conventional, you know, the farmer that is growing that food, his or her first consumers, their very own family. Um, there's a lot of care and commitment that is going into, you know, that, that peach or that piece of broccoli that reaches your table. And I think just, just reassuring consumers of that fact that people are working hard to ensure that they're giving you a safe, healthy, great tasting food. Mm. Amen. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing all of your wonderful information and all the great work you do. Everybody can go to my show notes to get all the resources or they can go straight to safefruitsandveggies.com and start checking it out right away. Yeah, I just appreciate you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com Music by Dave Burke